Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good evening. Welcome to IIS Forum. Tonight, we are going to discuss on the topic, the Emergency Ordinance Essential Powers 2021, Multiple Perspectives on Health, Economy and Politics. We are very indeed and delighted to have four panelists, very distinguished panelists. We have Prof. Dr. Ni Ahmad Kamal Nik Mahmud from the Department of Civil Law, Ahmad Ibrahim Kuni of Laws, International Islamic University of Malaysia. Professor Datuk Dr. Adiba Kamru Zaman, who is a former dean from the Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya, and now he is heading the Infectious Disease Unit. Datuk Dr. Medin Burma, Commissioner, Human Rights Commission of Malaysia, Suhaka. And last but not least, Professor Dr. Muhammad Azizuddin Muhammad Sani, School of International Studies, University of Utara, Malaysia. Ladies and gentlemen, the recent proclamation of emergency by the Yang Diputuan Agong cited grave concerns on national security, economic life and public order resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic. Officially termed as the Emergency Essential Powers Ordinance 2021, the Federal Constitution grants temporary special powers to the Agong in various areas including the authority to take over private hospitals, allocate state resources, as well as deploy additional military and police. Public reception to the proclamation, however, is mixed. Primary concerns revolve around the triumvirate of health, economy, and politics. Questions arise on the effectiveness on emergency compared to current movement control orders or MCO, and how it affects current policies aiming to strike a balance between health and the economy. In terms of politics, the ordinance has removed the possibility of having a general election up until August, sparking polarized debates on the merits of maintaining the present government or replacing it, especially in the overall fight against COVID-19. Under this backdrop, this forum features an array of expert panelists with diverse backgrounds. Okay, uh, Prof. Nick Kamal, maybe we can start first with you. So we have three rounds. So we have the first round, uh, followed by second, and perhaps in the middle, if we have the second round, we open the questions to the public. Otherwise, we will continue with the panelists, and then we will come back to, uh, to the public with the Q&A. Okay, Prof. Nick, perhaps uh, you can uh, answer these questions. The Emergency Ordinance Essential Powers 2021 contains several interesting provisions. Can you elaborate further on the ordinance, including several general highlights? Over to you, Prof. Nick. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. Thank you very much, Dr. Azam. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, very interesting forum. That, and I would like to welcome also members of the panels. Uh, and uh, indeed, this a uh, thing that is so hot today. I mean, in the sense that there's so many discussion debates, uh, online, the virtuals, and all, all kind of debates in the newspaper, in forums, and so on and so forth about the emergency. So I think there's no need to speak about emergency because the, uh, the discussion is always about whether, you know, whether the emergency is appropriate or not in the light of the circumstances now. Why countries uh, elsewhere, which also have the same problem with us, are not declaring emergency. Even if emergency is declared in some countries, uh, people have been raising this question, why parliament is not sitting and kind of mm. thing, right? Uh, rather than going into that, of course, uh, there will be other forums as well who are discussing, that are discussing on these issues. But going to your question, uh, Dr. Azam, regarding the Emergency Essential Powers Ordinance 2021, uh, in the light of the emergency declared recently, so uh, the constitution gives the power to the Yamaton Agong uh, to pass law that is called ordinance. Uh, law during emergency is called ordinance. Since if parliament is not sitting together, then the Yamaton Agong, the executive has the power to make this ordinance. This ordinance was passed recently. And uh, what are the, some of the inter interesting features about the ordinance is that uh, it deals with the specific issue of the pandemic itself. First and foremost, it, it provides uh, for, a, for an independent special committee, uh, which is 
to be established. I think the structure of the committee, we can see from the announcement, there are people who have already been assigned or being uh, appointed to that committee, except that we have heard about debate about whether the opposition will be willing to join and uh, you know and take part in the committee. I think the idea of independent, independent central committee is very interesting because uh, the, the role of the committee is to advise the Tuan Agong whether the existing emergency will continue or not. So that will be very, very interesting. But we hope that the opposition party members would also join and help you know, to decide uh, the future of this emergency, even though it is designated until August 1st, 2021, but we will never know that it may be extended or even it may be shortened. Uh, so that the role of the uh, temporary uh, committee is very important. Uh, I mean, the role of the independent special committee is very important. Now, uh, one significant provision, uh, which I think uh, has also subject to a lot of discussion is the power given to the executive to acquire temporarily possession of land, uh, building or movable property. Uh, you know, when we talk about pandemic before emergency, we, we heard about Akta 342 or Act 342, eh? the prevention uh, uh, of infectious disease, control and prevention of infectious disease. 1988. Now that act also provides for the same power of requisition, requisitioning uh, properties and building. Okay, but the provision of the ordinance of 2021 has much more wider power because I would say that it gives the authority or the executive the power to acquire, of course, like the Acta 342, but in terms of compensation, there, there is a slightly different approach because compensation. Uh, is paid, but in case of uh, dispute, the dispute will be uh, according to what the executive decides how to re resolve the dispute. Unlike Act 342, which says that dispute has to be uh, addressed or to be uh, referred to the under the Arbitration Act. So that is slightly a different uh, approach to this issue. But I believe that the whole uh, objective is to ensure that the uh, taking uh, the, the taking temporary possession of buildings or land or whatever property is necessary to use for the purpose of the pandemic. Uh, we recently we heard about uh, the government uh, discussing with the or uh, negotiating with the private hospital. So of course the law, even law outside emergency, can uh, you know give the power to the government to to, to, you know, to ask the private hospital to help. But the emergency ordinance gives more powers uh, to the government to even force. Uh, the authority or the uh, private hospitals to assist them and to provide whatever ne assistance is necessary. Now, the other provision, which is, I think, uh, should also be very interesting uh, to look into, is the power of the army to be equivalent power of the police. So the army can arrest uh, as a police officer. Okay. Then we have also some provision uh, protecting the health professionals, uh, the, uh, the the frontliners in the hospitals to be exempted from certain provision of the existing law, for example, the Medical Act, the Dentistry Act, the Pharmaceutical Act, and so on and so forth. So those requirements of the Act can be exempted because of the emergency. Uh, then, of course, the debate has always been raging about why Parliament is not sitting. So we, are, we have provision in the, in the ordinance which says that uh, the executive authority of the Federation remains with the existing uh, government, the existing cabinet and the prime minister, the state as well, uh, but parliament will not be sitting for the time being until uh, you know, the time is right to do so. Uh, so in fact, it's as a, a power is given to the Yantan Agong to call parliament sitting anytime when, when it is suitable to do so. It does not mean that parliament would not be sitting at all, except that what is already been scheduled for 2021 for parliamentary sitting would not be effective uh, in the right of the uh, provision of, uh, of the uh, emergency ordinance. Okay, and of course, um, there is also a, a sort of a, a, a clause or a clause which says that any law which is inconsistent or the ordinance which is inconsistent with the existing law, uh, the ordinance will prevail. So this is definitely in line with what the constitution has provided that whatever laws made pursuant to an emergency declaration would uh, may be inconsistent with the, any provision of the constitution except for article 
uh, matters pertaining to uh, religion, uh, you know, um, religion, language, citizenships, uh, uh, and also uh, related to races, right? So this cannot be touched. But other than that, uh, emergency ordinance that we have today may contravene any of the provisions of the constitution. But one thing that is important to note is that uh, even though ordinance made by uh, the Yang Tuan Agong during emergency can contravene any of the provisions of the constitution, it does not mean that it can contravene immediately. You know, it has to be an express provision in the existing law, which is the coordinates, which say that it is inconsistent with the provision of the constitution. Otherwise, the existing provision of the constitution remains as it is. It applies uh, unless an ordinance says that it will contravene. That is, I think we need to remember that because as far as the law of the country is concerned, the constitution still applies unless an ordinance has been passed to override whatever provision in the constitution. Uh, so I, I will stop at this uh, at this point, uh, and I will continue later on. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Nick. I think we well, caught a number of important points that you have raised. I think, but the last point that you just mentioned, I think, uh, I think uh, whatever provisions that provided by the ordinance, I think we have the ordinance twenty twenty one, mm -hmm. and if there are anything that contravenes or contrary to the provisions of the constitution, I mean, the government has to come up with a new ordinance, I suppose, uh, to, to take over what the provision that stated in the constitution. I think quite a number of questions that we can ask to you, Prof. Nick, on this matter, but I think we will reserve that. I personally also have a few questions, but I think we will reserve it later. Okay, now we move to Prof. Dato Adiba Kamaru Zaman. As we reach new daily cases in the four-digit numbers and our healthcare facilities on the verge of reaching its full capacity, what are your thoughts on the impact of the emergency ordinance on current health policies, including the MCO with its various levels of austerity? Yes, please. Prof. Hello, Michael, and, and good evening, everyone. And thank you as well for inviting me to be on this panel for this uh, interesting discussion. Uh, like Prof. Nick, uh, I guess, um, uh, we're not going to be debating the rights or wrongs of the, the emergency, but what is important is now that we are in this uh, uh, emergency and the MCO, what we do with, with the time um, to ensure that it's, you know, maximized uh, for, the, for the health benefits. Um, is the health system on the verge of collapse? And I think that was probably uh, one of the uh, impetus for uh, declaring the uh, emergency and there's no doubt that compared to the first and second waves um, we are seeing exponential uh, increase in the number of cases. If you recall in the first wave uh, and in the second wave the, um, the, the groups of people who were uh, infected were quite distinct um, and you know that the, cluster, the clusters were quite um, <laughs> you know, clusters that, that hadn't spilled over into the general community. The difference that we have now is uh, in addition to those uh, at-risk clusters like, um, you know, the, the factories and the foreign workers uh, and the prisons, we are definitely seeing um, a lot of ongoing community infection where, you know, you can't link it back to those at-risk um, or high-risk uh, occupations, etc. So, uh, the more we have this, um, uh, the more people who are going to obviously get, get infected. And and although some some people argue, but the but the death rate is relatively low compared to um, even to the first and second wave compared to the disease. However, you know, obviously the uh, the, the as as the proportion grows. Um, the number of people who are going to fall into that category of high risk where they are going to um, be at risk of getting severe disease is going to be more. We, we know that uh, at Hospital Sungabulo and certainly at my own hospital, if in the first and second wave, the majority of people who were admitted were young, relatively asymptomatic, the, 
you know, 60, 70, 80% had very mild symptoms. That proportion now uh, has uh, somewhat decreased and we're seeing a lot more people who are sicker and needing um, ICU. So it is um, the, the, the concern and uh, the concern has always been right from the very beginning that lockdowns all over the world was to preserve uh, the health system. So um, what for me, what we need to do now that we're in this uh, emergency, what I think uh, we need to take this time is to really, really um, try and bring the numbers down, the number of in, you know, infection, the, the, the incidence as we call it, um, as quickly as possible, uh, so that we um, uh, can get to a more manageable level. And how do we do that? We, we need to be much more aggressive than we are at the moment by you know, doing more community testing, finding the cases and isolating them so that you know, we can bring the numbers down and keep it down. I think that should be our number one goal. Um, it's very important now that we've declared the emergency and, and the MCO that we have an end game because we, one thing we don't want to be doing is being a lockdown forever or even worse, you know, we, of course, by, by locking people down, by, by having this uh, MCO, you will see some reduction in cases. But if you don't have a plan after that, as soon as you open up, you're going to uh, have the numbers again. So what? We're going to, we're going to uh, lock down again. So that, that cannot be the strategy. The strategy has to be very seriously try and bring the numbers down and keep it down and look at where the, the, the problems are. And, and I think this is where some of the, um, uh, you know, the legalities come, come into it. You know, two of the major, two of the major drivers of the infection are one, we know the, the foreign worker clusters, both documented and undocumented, right? And, uh, you know, we, we need to have a much more comprehensive holistic uh, strategy to deal with this. You know, it cannot just be testing we must address the underlying problem of uh, overcrowded accommodation. And, and I guess for those who are legally employed and have employers who can be asked to, to look into this, or can, who can be um, maybe asked is too, uh, too gentle a word, who, you know, who, who must be made to uh, seriously address the problem of uh, accommodation and uh, that's, that's causing um, the risk for infection is the undocumented migrants, um, you know, and that's a much, much more serious problem or, or difficult problem to deal with. And uh, here, I think the punitive approach is not the way to go. Um, and and recently there was an announcement that you know we're going to look for them again and uh, and lock them up and and. Um, you know, the, the first thing they're going to do is going to run away and hide and, you know, um, uh, be nidus for infections again. So I, I think we should use this time uh, to seriously look at the plans and the strategies in a much more, um, as I say, comprehensive, um, evidence-based, humane way of dealing with this very, very long standing problems that COVID has just, you know, brought to the surface. Um, and if, you know, if we want to, to, to seriously deal with the pandemic, unfortunately, we, fortunately or unfortunately, we're going to have to make some of these tough decisions. The other area that uh, this, we should use this time to make reforms is, of course, prison. You know, 10% um, of the overall national um, uh, infection, that, that was when I last checked uh, a few weeks, a few months ago, uh, arising from the prisons, from prisoners and the prison families and uh, staff. Now, you know, we, everybody knows about, the, about prison overcrowding. Um, so what can we do with it? You know, I, I, I believe in, in talking to my lawyer friends, there are already provisions to release on license um, prisoners who are either 
nearing their sentence or are there for very minor offence, that would immediately reduce uh, the number who are uh, of, of overcrowding. And, and I believe it. You know, there was a, um, a newspaper report from the Director General of Prison that close to 11,000 such prisoners uh, have been identified. Now, so that's in terms of what we call decarcerating. And many countries around the world have done this uh, because prisons have been a very hot spot for uh, COVID all over the world. Now, the, the other is, you know, so that, that can be immediately done. Um, then the other is, of course, to reduce the number of people going to prison in the first place. Um, and again, I say we should take this uh, opportunity during this emergency to do those, those kinds of, um, of reforms, uh, of serious uh, prison reform that will, in a way, um, you know, kill many birds with, with one stone. Um, if, if we're really, really serious about, first of all, controlling the pandemic, not just in the immediate um, stage right now to, to bring the numbers down quickly, but um, also in the mid to long term. Because as I said, you know, we, we can, by, by stopping everyone from moving, uh, you know, uh, through this MCO, we will, we will to, to a certain extent, bring it down. But as soon as you open up again, if you don't address these underlying uh, chronic problems, we're going to face um, uh, the issues all over again. Now, in terms of um, the provision that that, that Prof. Nick um, mentioned about acquiring private hospitals and such, I know there's been a bit of a fight back from uh, my private hospital colleagues. Um, yes, we need the help of our private hospital colleagues, and there are some private hospitals uh, that are more than equipped to handle um, patients with uh, COVID infection. But I think much more urgently is that we need the help to what we call decant uh, patients from the public system, including the university systems to the private health um, system to look after patients who are not uh, infected with, with COVID cancer patients, patients needing uh, elective or semi-elective surgeries. And this is where we, we are facing problems, you know, particularly uh, hospitals like mine, which are hybrid hospitals. You know, we, we still have to manage those patients who are coming in with heart attacks, with strokes, with um, whatever. And so we, if there is an arrangement with a private system that's more seamless um, and where, you know, uh, patients, obviously patients who come to either University Hospital, UMMC, or to, to HKL are those who can ill afford to go to private hospitals, otherwise they would have gone there in the first place. But there needs to be a mechanism of how, of the compensation to the private hospitals, um, and then there are issues of insurance. So I think um, these are the, the, the kinds of um, hopefully legalities and, and policies that uh, the emergency would, would look into. Um, and uh, so, so maybe I'll, I'll leave it there, but I think um, we must not waste this uh, MCO and this emergency and really, really use this time to not just bring the numbers down, but really um, look into the underlying issues that that's beyond health, uh, that in fact do require uh, legal and policy uh, that must be looked through the legal and policy lens if we don't want repeated MCOs and repeated um, lockdowns. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Adiba. I think there are a few questions that arise from your, your points, but I think the, your important point is uh, how can we, I think the government, we the people try to bring the numbers of this COVID-19 down. I think to compare, compare to last year's numbers of cases and this year, perhaps that will be slightly, I mean, quite a number of, of increment of that cases. And, and uh, what will be uh, the plan uh, for the government uh, to take action on this uh, after this MCO? And perhaps uh, I think the public would also like to know whether this MCO or they don't, they don't think that we will, we will have this MCO2 uh, for these two weeks. There will be an extension of this. So they are talking about it. And uh, they have been saying that there will be no Chinese New Year this year. There will be no Raya like uh, last year. 
that would be something that we need to, I mean, to observe that. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Prof Adiba. Now we move to Datuk Dr. Madeline Burma. Okay, the question to you, Dr. Datuk Madeline. Since the outset of the pandemic in late 2019 and early 2020, the health economy dilemma has always been a tricky question for policymakers worldwide. How do you think the emergency will affect current efforts to balance between health and economy, especially in the short and long term? Perhaps you may also touch a bit on the announcement made by the Prime Minister yesterday uh, on this uh, package of this, what we call it, the PERMAI package. Eh? Over to you, uh, Dato Medlin, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Azam. Just call me Medlin. I'm, I'm fine with that. I, I'm still trying to, I'm struggling to get used to all these uh, titles because I'm so used to get the 30 over years. My student just called me Dr. Meg. So I, I remember myself as Dr. Meg. But never, nevertheless, uh, thank you very much to IIAS for inviting me to share this, uh, this webinar with uh, and I mean, a really distinguished guest. I posted on my Facebook. I consider it is such an honor, you know, we, uh, with these three uh, speakers here, Dr. Nick, uh, Prof. Nick, Prof. Uh, uh, Dr. Adiba. I've never been on the same panel with Dr. Adiba. Uh, we've met uh, on different occasions, more of uh, for social functions. And then, uh, of course, Dr. Mohamed Azuddin, um, I always admire the work that he's doing. Okay, thank you very much. So basically, uh, uh, I would like to approach uh, uh, this discussion by presenting some graph for easy understanding because I, to me it is important rather than just um, uh, me highlighting it but let me just highlight eh? dr adiba i totally agree with the things that you say we must go beyond health in order to address this pandemic and in my case i would want to go beyond economics so that we can understand that it needs a holistic kind of approach because you did mention about you know prison reform i am in i am in suhakam right now we are struggling with that uh, with this request uh, from the public uh, but i will go into that let me just share my slide uh, my name is let me see uh, oh let me see uh, can you see can you see my slide no not yet oops not yet, nah, Doctor Mukti. Alama, uh. ini yang I bagu na action kat you all ni. How to do that? <laughs> okay, now it's uh, coming. I think, yeah. It's coming, but I can't okay. see. Okay. Is it? Is it there? Uh, uh. Ah, there. Yes, Adakah? yes. Now okay. it's there. Yes, uh, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. The state of emergency and the economy. So my task today is just to give an understanding of. Is there really need for an emergency? People have been uh, sending WhatsApp to me. Not that I am the Prime Minister. They think that I know uh, a few things about the emergency and the economy. I will give my opinion. Although uh, Prof Azam just now said we cannot criticize the government. I'm not here to criticize the government. I'm here to just give my critical comments. Whether there is a need or and even if it is a critical comment, it is kritikan yang membina dengan tujuan untuk penambahbaikan. Yeah? Okay. Now, I think most of us have seen uh, people in the economics almost every day. We will love to see uh, what we call uh, uh, this graph. Let us just look at the graph up here first. Eh? Uh, I don't want, I don't intend to go into the detail, but this is what uh, Dr. Dato Adiba was saying just now. And also, this is this very famous line. Eh? This is uh, what we call this is the capacity of our uh, health facilities. If we go above this, Meaning to say the COVID cases, there are more COVID cases uh, and our ability to manage it. So this will be a problem. It will lead down to, this is the economic curve. It will lead to what we call a dip in our gross domestic product. It will lead to a dip in the economic growth. So there is a relationship between the higher you go, the lower this one goes down. Okay. So just for simplicity. So that's why it's very, very important for us to make sure bila the word landai kan kelo to flatten the curve what it means is to ensure that this curve goes down to this blue curve so that our capacity our uh, our medical facilities our medical capacity can manage at the moment i think you too did mention uh, to the point that if we are not careful we may reach a breaking point whereby we may be already here 
whereby it is ready where we where our medical uh, uh, infrastructure medical facilities may not be able to cope with it anymore that's why the importance of having uh, the mco now the next question do we really need an emergency now that question i think uh, prof nick kamal you are the right person to answer and later maybe prof azudin we in economics we said we uh, for me uh, i am not uh, speaking on behalf of the other economists for me for the time being we may not necessarily need an emergency because to us an emergency we we may need okay let, let's put it this way even if we need it it is only for a very very short time that is to ensure that we can uh, the, the emergency will bring about a flattening of this curve and so that our economy can go back to its normal time okay let's not go into this boring economic uh, curve now another thing that i would like to share share with members here so that we will understand what we where the situation our economic situation right is so 2019 in december this is quarter four meaning to say at the end of uh, between from maybe i think october november december this is quarter four our economy is really uh, really if you can see that we are going down negative we in fact we uh, had a negative negative 17.1 percent in terms of our if you look at our gross domestic product we economists look at this now if we look at the curve this is what we call the v-shaped curve there are so many different types of curve it can be a v-shape which is one of the things that we economists love to see meaning to say it dips down and it goes up again immediately that is something that we really hope for what we may not want to have a, a kind of curve is the U curve. It goes down and then it goes flat and it slowly goes up. Another thing that we may, uh, we may experience is W curve. It, go, it dips, it goes up a bit, and then it goes down again and it goes up. But the most frightening of all is the L curve. It goes down and it never goes up. Now, in Malaysia, what the government is doing its best is to ensure we get a v curve to get a sharp uh, uh, although there is a sharp dip in our gross domestic product but what we needed is actually to quickly make sure that the growth increase as fast as possible now this is where the argument for an mco some people say we could have an mco it's already good enough why do we need an emergency so that will be for other reasons for the economies an mco has already brought this down but uh, an emergency properly proclamation as uh, as we can uh, as we heard what the yang pertuan agung mentioned it was basically to flatten the health uh, uh, the pandemic curve now the kind of loss that we are experiment uh, we are experiment uh, experiencing during this period now the highest percentage is uh, in uh, in may last year where our unemployment rate is one of the highest that we have ever experienced 5.3% almost 1 million of our people were experiencing uh, unemployment although we don't see these figures but you know if, uh, but it is slowly being reduced now because you see these kind of figures are just like a doctor i assume a medical doctor when they see all this you know uh, on the screen where they say ping, ping, you know it goes up we economists also experience uh, when we see this kind of curve it is really frightening you look at that it goes up but luckily it's slowly going down because uh, if you know that uh, even when we uh, when the study was asked uh, on the SMEs, what are the things that they experienced before MCO and after MCO? Many of them, uh, if you notice the figure there, they were saying that there's a lot of uh, there's an, uh, a negative impact. And then areas of most uh, of business most affected, so they call it uh, so cash flow and also sales. So you imagine with the total lockdown. So this is the thing that we really fear in economics total lockdown because of, uh, because of the need to uh, to flatten the uh, the health curve uh, the pandemic curve on the other hand it has really left an impact on the economy so when uh, dr adiba said just now we need to go beyond looking at all these things so i totally agree uh, it is not just through lockdown similarly in economics i will let you know that uh, i don't really uh, feel uh, i don't really think that we should use purely every time there is an increase in the number we do a lockdown and that is where the economic will be very much affected and then what the government will do they will come up with another uh, fiscal injection that they will come with in fact we have five this is the fifth one 
uh, you you expected me to discuss. I will do that in the second round later, the Permai one. Uh, what are the things that I say, the good points and some of the things that I expected, okay? I have to move on. So the most people who are most affected are the golongan rentan or what we call the vulnerable groups, yeah? Kanak-kanak, warga mas, that includes me, orang kurang upaya, HIV, mangsa bencana. And now, not only bencana, we have bencana now, uh, you know, with the, uh, with the, what do you call it? With the banje and everything. And also those affected by the shock. Some people in the T20, they lost their job. They are also very much affected. Orang asli, orang asal, and the fakir and daif. Kami orang iban, panggil dia orang ni, gulungan ini, merinsa. You know, you cannot even define them with poverty. They are called merinsa. That was the word. Okay, the last uh, one I want to show is that these are the four uh, stimulus packages that the government have put in place. Total, 305 billion. Never in the history of Malaysia, the government has put up with so much to assist it with this kind of a problem. Now, we just had the fifth one, which is worth 15 billion. Now, this brings to the next question. One, do we need a lockdown? Two, do we need an emergency? Three, is this going to be another package? How many stimulus package do we need? Or do we need something else? As what Dr. Adiba, I really agree with her. I, this one I will discuss later. Okay, and if you look at the economic report, it says that last year, the economic report, they expected us to grow between 6.5% to 7% in 2021 after contracting about 4.5%. Uh, so the most important question now is that uh, what kind of approach do we need? The kind of strategies do we need? Yes, all the kind of stimulus packages package that we had, including the, 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 the one that has just been announced yesterday by the Yama Borma Perdana Menteri. It is a stimulus package uh, that involves a like, kind of a hands out, short term. But what I am looking for is more of long term that is sustainable, that empowers the community. Yeah. So I think with that, I will close my discussion. So I will wait for the next round to answer the Permai uh, discussion later. Thank you very much, Dr. Azam. Okay, thank you very much, huh? Dr. Medlin. I think you raised quite a number of important points. I think, I think, I think from the economic perspective, we can see, I think, uh, as you mentioned, the government has uh, pumped quite a lot of these packages huh, to help the economy. Uh, I think, uh, I think how much more that the, the government to need to spend for this. And, and uh, I think from the unemployment rate, you raised, I mean, it, it, it reach has reached almost a million and now it is i think decreased a bit if not mistaken about 800 uh, i mean yeah. uh, thousand uh, unemployment rate now i think that will be something which i think it will affect uh, the country and uh, i i i agree with you uh, i think i mean from the economic point of view it's not good for for, for the country but uh, i think maybe for the uh, politicians, uh, for if we were to talk about politics, there will be something good, I suppose, for both the MCO, especially for the emergency. Now we move to Professor Muhammad Azizuddin. Eh? I think this is quite interesting because he's, uh, he's from the, uh, we'll call it from this political science. Eh? Among the most apparent uh, impact of the ordinance to our domestic politics is that we cannot have a fresh general election as well as other small elections up until August. This was done at the height of several party leaders publicly mulling for it in the near future. Hence, it has sparked polarized debates on the merits of maintaining a government that is slowly losing support or replacing it. What are your thoughts on the matter, especially in the oral context of fighting the COVID-19 pandemic. Over to you, Prof. Azizuddin. Uh, Assalamualaikum and also very good uh, evening uh, to Prof. Azam. And also, uh, and also thank you very much to IAIS for inviting me uh, as one of the speaker for, for this forum. Yeah? And also, uh, and first of all, I think I want to uh, express gratitude as well to my fellow uh, panelists yeah? because they already cover a lot of things. Uh, which also meaning that I don't I don't need to uh, to cover and also to discuss uh, a touch of few things regarding health, even legal issue and also economy. Yeah? And uh, and just uh, just now listening to uh, Madeline uh, mentioning about we have to go beyond health, we go beyond uh, economy. I'm not sure whether we are going towards beyond politics 
in looking in the context of COVID-19. Yeah? But uh, what, uh, you know, whatever happens actually is a political decision yeah? in order to have a, a proclamation of the emergency. Yeah? And I think the first point I want to raise here, uh, even though uh, Professor mentioning about election, I won't go uh, later about election. First thing I think regarding declaration or, or proclamation eh, of uh, emergency is not something uh, new or rare eh? uh, because it's happened everywhere in the world actually. Eh? In fact, for example, I'll give you some of the facts. Eh? Uh, in the case of uh, United States, for example, eh? out of 50 states uh, in the United States you know, that they have, uh, 48 declare emergency eh? in order to deal with the issue of COVID-19. Eh? So meaning that uh, COVID-19 is a, a really, uh, you know, big issue. And the recent country that declared for, you know, uh, emergency is Lebanon. Eh? And I think you can see that, you know, uh, and one country, another, probably I want to mention is uh, like Romania, that ha uh, they decided to delay their uh, general election because of COVID-19. So in that case, COVID-19 is something very serious that the government and the people should deal with the issue. Eh? In fact, I think I remember even last year, uh, I I always reminded uh, uh, you know, uh, my uh, during interviews uh, with the media saying that uh, we already uh, managed to deal uh, you know uh, successfully the first wave uh, but as we know that uh, the Spanish flu uh, in 1918 if I'm not mistaken uh, that uh, where the world faced three kind of wave uh, of Spanish flu uh, so meaning that in the context of nation right now we already face the third wave, you know, I don't know how many waves that we have to deal, but this is something very serious. Yeah? And when health issue become big global issues, uh, also it will affect economy and also will affect political uh, 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 scenario as well. Yeah? In uh, not only in Indonesia, everywhere in the world. If you look in United States, for example, the crisis also uh, contributed contributed uh, by uh, the 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 weaknesses of the government dealing with the issue of COVID nineteen. Yeah? Okay, that's I think the first point because for me, declaration is not uh, uh, government can take something uh, uh, effort uh, to declare uh, 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 emergency, and the most important thing is what's the justification of the government to declare emergency, uh? and uh, uh, this is create a debate right now uh, with uh, uh, many uh, session of the society. You know? In fact, even the opposition also uh, calling for what is the justification of the government. Uh? But for me, personally, as academic, I think COVID-19 economic factor in the country already is a big issue, eh? uh, which I think requires the government to give a full focus. Eh? Uh, the problem if, uh, right now in Malaysia is that uh, this uncertainty in politics is so high. Yeah? So um, where, you know, uh, clash yeah? within the Perikatan National Government and so together uh, the challenge uh, with the uh, kata harapan uh, government to the government as well makes uh, the government's effort to focus more on politics rather than uh, rather than dealing with the issue of economy and also uh, issue of uh, health. Yeah? That's why I think uh, our region, uh, our Agong, you know, Agong, and also our Royal Council keep reminding uh, people to be less politicking. Yeah? Uh, so and also politician as well, because now is not the time for us to fight each other. Uh, but we have to be together to solve the issue of COVID-19 and also uh, economic issue, which I think also very important uh, uh, to help our, our nation to be uh, uh, you know, sustained yeah, uh, during the COVID-19 period right now. Yeah. Okay, that's the second point. Yeah. The third point I think I want to raise is um, regarding election. I think you mentioned just now about election. As we know that uh, we... Uh, uh, already declared three and uh, another two uh, proclamation of uh, of emergency. Yeah? One is uh, in Batu Sapi and another one uh, with regard to Greek and also uh, Bugaya uh, violation. Yeah? So meaning that uh, uh, that's is the option that can can be allowed to postpone yeah? uh, the the violations. Yeah? And as we know that uh, I'm not sure. Uh, probably government also need to clarify on this whether the decision eh, to declare proclamation of uh, emergency also because of to delay the election of uh, actually the state election in Sarawak eh, which is scheduled to be held in uh, June uh, uh, this year. Eh. So 
uh, because the effect that we saw what happened in Sabah uh, state relation is very great eh, because it's contributed to the second or so third wave of the COVID-19. Eh. So that probably uh, give indication eh, uh, for our regions, eh, our agong and so our government that we need to declare emergency. Reluctantly that, you know, you can see that at the first time when government proposed eh, uh, the idea to agong uh, and also the council, they rejected the idea. That, but now they are accepted uh, the idea because uh, we need to pull our resources, uh, effort all to deal with the issue of uh, COVID-19. Eh? So in, I think in overall, you know, uh, many argue that uh, through the ordinance of emergency eh, 2021, uh, there's a restriction eh, of the role of parliament, for example, eh, and also a constitution as well. Eh? But for me, uh, you know, the, the opposition, even the government also can call for a special sitting of the parliament if they want to, to discuss about issue of COVID-19 and economy. That's one thing. Eh? The second uh, things, I think, the role of the opposition as well can still there, you know? meaning that the, the check and balance still, uh, uh, still can be allowed and also they can use many platforms actually. Not only the parliament, but now we have social media and, and also our media that can check and balance of the government. Eh? But the role of check and balance of the government should be there. Yeah? Uh, because there's a many accusations saying that uh, because too much power given to executive, that uh, there's a tendency towards dictatorship yeah? uh, after this. Yeah? Which I doubt it would happen. Yeah? Because the, the pro proclamation of emergency right now is not a martial law. Yeah? It's a just a, a, a proclamation about health yeah? to deal with the issue of COVID-19. So it's very specific task to deal with the issue of health. So meaning that uh, this is not like emergency happened in 1969, 13 May 1969. It's just uh, emergency of health. So by, by having strong opposition right now, I think they can check and balance of the role of government and make sure that government don't go beyond the power given to them uh, to deal with the issue. So I think in overall, uh, even though I'm at the beginning, I'm very a bit skeptical about the declaration of uh, uh, emergency. But so far, what I see going on right now, I think probably that's going to be the best option uh, right now eh, to deal with the issue of COVID-19. Eh? Uh, because, uh, uh, you know, government can really pull off effort and resources, you know, uh, you know can also take over university if they want to, eh, to deal uh, with, the, uh, with the issue of COVID-19 if suddenly uh, the level of infection is so high that they need buildings, for example, to, 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 to assist uh, the needs, yeah? uh, uh, those who are affected with, the, the, uh, with COVID-19. So I think I'm, I'm, that's all for the, for, for, the, uh, for the beginning. Probably in the second round, I think I will uh, elaborate further on this uh, issue. Thank you, Prof. Azam. Back to you. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Prof. Azizuddin. Yeah. It, it means that you are in favour to the emergency that we are experiencing that now i think from the political science perspective i think you have mentioned uh for example united states alone uh, from uh, 48 out of 56 have declared emergency and i think it's also taking place uh, in other countries as well and of course uh, by delaying uh, elections uh, the i mean the so-called general elections also the by elections uh, can give more concentration for the government to tackle this pandemic. And I think uh, you have mentioned uh, towards the end of your presentations, your point that I think people talking about uh, whether uh, the present government uh, have this, what we call, do they have this check and balance that in, the, in, in Malaysia by having this emergency? And you have mentioned uh, without having parliaments uh, sitting, uh, I think Malaysia can also practice this, but it's all back to the agong for that matter as far as uh, the matter is concerned. Okay, we are now moving to round two. Huh? We go back to Prof. Nick. Huh? How does this particular ordinance compare with other instances in our history where the state of emergency was invoked? Are there any significant similarities or differences? Prof. Nick, please. Well, if you trace the history, um... Uh, we have, uh, I think, since independence, no, we have gone through many emergencies. Uh, and many of these emergencies we declared was, were basically focused 
emergency or specified emergency to specific area or states. Eh? 1966 was Sarawak because of the collapse of the civil governments. And 1969, of course, it was a national level emergency, a federal level emergency uh, due to the uh, racial riot. And of course, uh, that was the, the biggest emergency since in Merdeka. And then 1977, it was Kelantan, again, due to the collapse of the civil government. But uh, when Kelantan uh, was declared, uh, when the emergency was declared in Kelantan, the 1969 emergency was still subsisting. And in fact, we were in fact two state emergencies, in 69, then at the federal level, 77 in Kelantan. Um, and then 1997, uh, due to the haze uh, problems, I think there was a uh, focused uh, declaration of emergency. Uh, and then 2005 and 2013 also pursuant to the haze problem uh, with two specific area. I think Kelang, Pelabuhan Kelang, Muar, Kuala Lumpur, uh, Ledang, you know. And, um, and of course, 2020 last year, we have uh, the declaration of three emergencies for the purpose of uh, postponing uh, elections in uh, mentioned uh, by Prof. Aziz just now. Uh, they, they want Unangan Negeri Bukaya, Batu Sapi Parliament and Batu and Greek also Parliament. And of course, uh, recent, recent emergency, national emergency 2021. So, I mean, that is already an indication of the reason for emergency is different one. There are different reasons for it. And uh, if you were to compare 1969 emergency and today's emergency, uh, you see the focus of 1969 was to deal with, with uh, the racial riot, uh, dealing with uh, emergency that affects public safety and defense of the country. Okay, uh, just, to, re just to, to also note that before Merdeka, there was already an emergency, okay, 1948 due to the communist insurgency. Uh, but of course that was when we were, uh, uh, we were under the British uh, authority. All right, so 69 and 2021, totally two different uh, reasons for an emergency. So 69 was particularly focused on how to deal with this uh, racial disharmony, how to deal with you know, people on the street fighting each other. Uh, so law was passed, the ordinance of 1969, the, the name is the same, Essential Powers uh, Ordinance 1969 to deal with creating new offenses uh, to, to make it more stringent to punish people who are possessions of arms, possession of firearms, and also to deal with these offenses swiftly by providing special procedures uh, to put them into jail or even to put them uh, in the gallows for commissions of very serious offense. Okay, and of course, uh, it gives power to the central government, the central authority, the executive, uh, the Yang Tipton Agong, uh, the Prime Minister and the Cabinet was given power to make laws to give all these, uh, you know, these uh, urgent matters and to deal with them effectively. Okay, so, but the thing is about 1969 emergency was immediately after general elections. Okay, and uh, after that, uh, before the, 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 sworn, sworn, the, the sworn in of the Prime Minister and the Cabinet, uh, there was an emergency declared. So it was a caretaker government until the situation was, uh, it was under control, then only the civil government was, was, uh, was able to actually go about and carry out their duties, all right? And after the, you know, after the establishment of civil government, the government went on to, to be established as an ordinary government where parliament was in session, general election was held, because of the ability to control the situation or the danger or the, uh, the insurgencies 1969. So you see that, that the unique thing about 1969 emergency was that uh, the ordinary government came into, into play uh, not long after uh, the ability to control the insurgency. So as a result of that, uh, until 2000, if I'm not mistaken, 2012, the 1969 emergency was was, was uh, revoked and all laws passed pursuant to the 1969, 19, uh, uh, 1977 uh, was also revoked. So in that light, we are back into normal situation 
post throughout 2012. All right. So uh, if you were to look at the scenario today, 2021, uh, and the provision of the ordinance that we have seen just now, uh, that there's no parliament sitting, uh, you know, and uh, election will be would not be called, you know, and if there are uh, vacancy in the seat, they will not be filled up. No election can be held, whether it is PRK or PRU for, for that matter. PRU, uh, Sarawak also would also be likely to be postponed in light of, of that. Uh, so uh, I believe that the reason is, is, is justified in the sense that uh, the need to deal with the pandemic is so, uh, so overwhelming uh, that uh, the government needs to have more powers rather than just relying on ordinary law that we have. I think uh, Dr. Adiba has already mentioned about the possibility of using this law that we have today, the ordinance, to deal with not just the pandemic, but to do measures that will help to reduce the pandemic. Right? For example, I think Dr. Adiba has mentioned about the possibility of you know, releasing those who are already in prison to those who are already about to about to complete their sentence, so why not release them? Those who are uh, to be sentenced to imprisonment would probably be, uh, you know, sort of, uh, sort of delayed uh, and provide them with other measures or other punishment so that things can be better in the prison. That, that is one aspect. But of course, with the powers that the government have uh, under the ordinance, I believe there's so many things that government can do. For example, I can tell you that uh, there's a provision in the ordinance of 2021 that gives the Yantuan Agong power to make regulation. Okay, regulations are quick laws over and above the ordinance to deal with specific issues. Okay, so all these measures that I think uh, those who are the experts in, in dealing with, you know, the pandemic, be able to recommend to the government that how to deal with these measures effect effectively by providing regulations, okay, to um, specific issues, specific measures. Okay, so in that respect, I believe uh, what we have today with the ordinance and all the powers that are given to the executive, it can be used for the goods of the society as a whole, and it's not just meant to, you know, sort of uh, put into place things that are already in place. It's just, I think, it's more than that. It requires, I think, the uh, the knowledge, the expertise of everyone uh, in the country to help the government in this aspect. So this can be sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, can be assisted by the, 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 you know, the, the law that the government can make uh, immediately. Yeah, I think that's, that, that's the thing that we need to see uh, during the emergency. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, huh? uh, Prof Nick. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think I think you you have stressed I think from the first round that this uh, this emergency is important uh, for for the country and I think you have given is I think this is not the first time that the country has experienced this this circumstance. I think we have experienced it uh, in the series of emergency. Uh, in, fact, in fact, before uh, Merdeka in 1948, I think. Uh, with these uh, 1966, I think uh, I think perhaps uh, the one that we are experiencing uh, this year, 2021, would be very very different from 1969 and, and the other emergency. I think we, with that, I think your point that uh, we need that ordinance of emergency uh, for that matter. Now we move to Prof uh, Adiba. Okay, I think this is something that perhaps you have mentioned in your in the first round, but perhaps you may add some of the points. Eh? In your view, what are the most important steps that we should take to improve our domestic health situation? Over to you, Prof. Adiba. Yes, certainly. And I think uh, I, I want to once again stress that we, we must and we cannot waste this uh, period of lockdown as you've seen the impact on the economy that um, Madeline has shown is really grave. So you know, we, we have to do things somewhat differently from, from before. And uh, it worries me a little bit that, well, more than a little bit, it worries me that um, it would appear that the strategy now with the Ministry of Health is not so much to test for, to look for cases, and, uh, but instead to just manage people who are already symptomatic. 
Now, certainly from a, a clinical point of view, that's very important to, to diagnose people who, uh, who have symptoms so that you can manage them clinically. But from a public health point of view, from what we understand about this virus, we must still continue to try and break the chain of transmission. We must still continue to try and flatten the curve. Uh, in other words, uh, during this, this emergency, during this MCO, we shouldn't fall, pull back on the testing and, and uh, looking for active cases, but we should, in fact, intensify the uh, finding of cases, testing, isolating them because and I repeat, we need to break the chain. Um, you know, we, we need to flatten the curve in mean, all, these, all these cliches. And, and the reason for that is because, um, you know, to, to allow, of course, to allow the health systems uh, to cope uh, by, by, by breaking the chain, but also um, we just can't afford to have a runaway pandemic like what we've seen in the UK and, and the US, you know, as as, uh, uh, as, as good or as the NH NHS system is, they're, they're at a breaking point. So we, we cannot allow ourselves to go to that point. And, you know, they're already warning signs about the new variant. This is a very clever virus. Um, it's going to continue to mutate and uh, we, we don't know what else, what, you know, how, how much more infective it's going to be. And, uh, and the vaccine is going to be, you know, sometime yet. So uh, point number one, intensify testing, intensify, um, you know, looking for cases so that uh, we, we can break the chain. And um, how do we do that? We, we need to get, I, I know I've watched my colleagues in PKD and I, you know, my heart goes out to them, how hard they're working and, and how difficult the work is. We must move away from, of course, we must still continue to do the passive contact tracing, but what we need to do is to be better at using, you know, technology to, um, to identify the hotspots where the clusters are. And uh, in a way, we're already kind of trying to do this um, in, in Slango using uh, digital analytics and identifying hotspots and, and target those uh, mass testing in those areas. So we need, we need to move towards um, digital technology and uh, be much more precise with our uh, testing efforts. So that's number one. Number two, you're going to say, but you know, if you're going to go out and look for more cases, your, your hospitals are already um, at the point of collapse. Uh, how, uh, how much, how, how are we going to cope? Well, as I said, in actual fact, 80% of people are either asymptomatic or have very mild symptoms. And if we have a good system in place, they can be managed at home. Unfortunately, we now, Ministry of Health is now starting to move towards that, but we need to move a lot more quickly in having, um, you know, in, um, in allowing people to be managed and monitored at home again. Uh, using digital technology, as well as mobilizing our general practitioners to assist in uh, home isolation. Of course, not everyone can be in, in those two categories can be managed at home. Um, those who can't, for whatever reasons, uh, you know, either they have big families living in a PPR flat or, or, or uh, you know, foreign workers uh, who don't have a place to return to that you know, doesn't have uh, 10, 15 other people in, in the house, of course, they, they can go to one of these government low risk centers, but a, a large proportion of those who were in um, acute care hospitals can be uh, managed at home. So that, that's uh, another thing that we need to do and, and we need to have a proper program to do this as fast as possible. And the third thing that I think that we need to do differently 12 months on from the pandemic is we must must learn to work better together we need to decentralize ministry of health needs to work with private hospitals need to work with teaching hospitals need to work with ngos now if, if we're calling for um you know the release of uh, low uh, prisoners who are um about to you know finish their sentence 
where are they going to go, right? So, um, you know, the, the, the solution would be, part of the solution would be to mobilize um, uh, NGOs who are already working in these kinds of areas uh, to assist. Likewise, with um, the, the migrant workers, uh, documented and undocumented. You know, I don't know if we've done enough to educate uh, non-English, non-Malay, non-Bahasa, Chinese-speaking uh, non-citizens uh, on on um, the COVID pandemic. You know, and the best way to do that would be to engage um, their own communities um, and um, uh, you know uh, bring them into it. And I'm speaking this from from you know. Ex the 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 uh, success uh, of of the HIV pan, uh, response to the HIV pandemic. You know, one of the essence of the HIV response is to work with the community. And I think there are many things that we can learn from from the HIV response that would be very applicable um, to the COVID pandemic. One of which is uh, community engagement and, and mobilization of community workers. And then, of course paying attention to things like inequality, um, you know, uh, and, and human rights uh, and all those basic, basic principles, if applied uh, to the COVID pandemic, um, inshallah, we'll, we'll see uh, a change. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Atiba. I think you have points, the, uh, pointed out these three important uh, facts on this. I think uh, perhaps uh, the Ministry of Health, I think, should uh, take seriously into your three points that you mentioned. I think the 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 last point that you mentioned about that, uh, we must work together. The Ministry of Health must work together. Not only I think the public hospital must work together with the private hospital, with the NGOs, etc. So I think this is something that uh, we should have planned it uh, before during the uh, the first. We, if I can say that, uh, I think uh, we have been facing this uh, not recently. It has been almost a year, and then I think uh, we should sit down and make a proper plan for this. Okay, thank you very much, Prof Adiba. Okay, now we move to uh, the second round for the uh, uh, Dato Nedlin. Uh, if I can say, are there examples or research from the global community that we can learn? From, from in terms of balancing the impact of health and economy? Dr. Medley? Uh, can you unmute, please? Uh, I'm so sorry. My, uh, my internet is really, really unstable right now. So maybe it goes with the... Uh being a Southian probably, so I'm not too sure. Okay, all right. Uh, if, if it happened to kind of break off, then you know what to do. You just uh, get the next speaker, uh, get from uh, the Sir Muhammad Azuddin to continue because I'm really having problems right now. Okay, uh, uh, there are two things that I would like to respond. The first one just now before I forget about the, remember you asked me about the permise and later I will share uh, in terms of trying to balance between health and, and and economics and in fact in the in the context of Malaysia, although Prof Azudin did did not mention that, I would like to see or rather look at it more as the triple kind of issues crisis that we have to to deal with. One is of course the health, then followed by economics, and uh, on overlapped with that is our uh, with uh, politics. So it's really an interesting uh, case study to be studied. You know, if you if you really look in the context of Malaysia now. Uh, back to the question about Permai yesterday. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I look forward to the Permai, uh, what do you call it, the, the, the fifth uh, stimulus package. But after a while, then I keep on asking myself, is there going to be another stimulus package? Number one. Number two, what is the amount? Okay, we already have, as, as I mentioned, uh, the, the four uh, packages was worth 305 billion. And the recent one, the Permai, is about 15 billion. So if we are going to have another more of these packages in the manner that it is being presented now, it's always about uh, fiscal stimulus injection. That what about our, you know, the, the ability of the government? Because uh, the ability of the government to finance all these people are already asking 
First, uh, I remember during the PH government, my whole life I've never heard about a one trillion dollar thing. Suddenly, first time in my life, I said, how many zeros is there in a trillion dollar? So we heard about our debt worth one trillion dollar. And then suddenly it goes missing. I don't know what, what happened to it. And then suddenly now, we are talking about billions of uh, uh, stimulus packages. I'm not saying that it is not there. You, it is real. It is very much um, part of the packages. And I see it there. As I said, it was uh, it was estimated about 20% of our gross domestic product. One of the, I mean, if you look at countries across the world, uh, people of the same level of development with Malaysia, we are one of those countries that really put a lot of emphasis in terms of trying to address that. So I must congratulate the government for doing this short-term approach. But how long can we do that? Eh? And, and that's where I really agree with uh, Prof uh, Adiba when you, when you say we must go beyond that. Uh, she, she even mentioned about just now, human rights. So I really love you for that, uh, Prof Adiba. You know, uh, there was, uh, we had, we re I received, not we, uh, I received a lot of hate messages immediately after, you know, when, when there was a, the, a, a lockdown and there was a, a, the, the Rohingyas and the, what do you call it, uh, when there was in the Slango mansion and everything, because uh, we in Sohakam said uh, they, they also had their rights. Oh, suddenly all Malaysians said, what do you mean, what, what, you, what you talk about their rights? What about our rights as Malaysians? So you see, in situation like this, uh, these are very, very sensitive issues. You know, in the past, Mal Malaysians are very open to having foreigners in the midst of us. But suddenly now, now with the COVID and everything, you, uh, uh, Suhakam have in fact um, declared, uh, not, not declared, we even uh, issued a press uh, statements about uh, xenophobia happening in our country in the midst among Malaysians, hate speeches. So I'm glad that Prof Adiba, you brought this up today and you're just before me. So thank you very much. So back to the issue of, uh, do we have experiences from other countries, uh, the ability to balance. Okay, uh, I'm not too sure about that. But what I can say is that uh, when, we, uh, when I look into the World Health Organization, you know, that's basically, and then the World Bank, the IMF, most of the time, they are always uh, trying to struggle with this idea of, first, you must flatten the pandemic curve. Then, uh, automatically, uh, uh, to a certain extent, it says that you will be able to address the short-term effect of the, uh, uh, the, 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 what do you call, the pandemic uh, in terms of mitigating the pandemic and how we can lower our economic um, uh, slowdown. So the, the argument has always been you, you have to stop the pandemic. And the, the interesting thing, when we first started, we started by doing this lockdown because China was uh, there was this logistic issue whereby in order for us to stop uh, the pandemic, the only thing that we knew then, that was a year back, is by uh, reducing what we call, we must stop, or rather we must practice social distancing, number one. Number two is to reduce the density of human beings and in, in one particular area. So that is why we stop in terms of production. You cannot go to office, you cannot go to your kilang or your industries to go for to do your work because that is where the high density of population is. On the other hand, we have to stop consumption and that's why we cannot go to our mama store, we cannot do all the things. But to a large extent, it had left a very big dent in terms of our economic. So, uh, so the government really was struggling with trying to balance that. So in the effort to, uh, to balance this up, uh, then I have I was of the opinion that uh, the the what we call that the politics suddenly come in. Then we heard about the pintu belakang, pintu depan, pintu istana, so many pintus. And then now, uh, but um, uh, we heard from uh, the uh, the proclamation by the Yang Pertuan Agong. It is basically uh, in terms of uh, the objective is for COVID. So if you ask me, uh, countries have struggled with it trying to balance it up. But many countries, like many developed countries, what they normally do, they are going now into one is, of course, I think this is where Dr. Adiba can, can give a better explanation. Now, with the vaccine coming in, now I am struggling. Why is it that Malaysia is uh, a bit slow? Uh, do I consider us slow or are we being cautious? Or are we being... Um, uh, uh, because I know that our neighbours are already... Uh, and I, I don't know, can you say that they're already inoculated, uh, what, 
uh, already prescribing that to their population or what. But we are still waiting until February, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So, so these are kind of issues. So the economists were saying, we already have the vaccine. Why are we waiting here? Because to us, anything that can slow down the pace of the pandemic, so that is good for the economy. But on the other hand, we cannot put economy above and everything else. Because at the end of the day, you know, human lives are more valuable than you know, the economic figures of, you know, we are very worried about our ratings. You know, people, the economists are worried, oh my goodness, our fish rating, we have gone down. Now we are at a different rating. Soon, Moody's rating will come out. And when rating goes down, what it means is that foreign investors start thinking, should we come to Malaysia? As it is now, we know that many of the big companies are already shifting their, um, their, their, uh, uh, their investment to our neighbours. I will not name which neighbours, but we are really now struggling with the idea that um, that we are no longer the preferred destination for foreign investors. So this is what we call dala jato di timpa tangga dala tangga tu and it jatuh lagi you know the, this flower pot again on our head. So as uh, all of all of uh, all of us have rightly mentioned, we need to protect our ourselves, our uh, you know diri sendiri, our family, our community. We cannot rely too much on the government. There is a limitation to what the government can do. So my point, uh, I always uh, when I discuss this. Uh, with my indigenous communities, we need to empower the people to take care of their own health, to empower themselves economically, to empower them to so that they should not rely purely on the government, waiting for the government. Because in Malaysia, we have this uh, policy of one size fits all. It's really like Panadol. You patah kaki pun dia bagi Panadol, you kepala pun Panadol. You just look at the uh, education. You know, you lock down everybody, education, uh, berhenti. And it, in fact, those people in the Ulu areas of Sarawak, I don't even know whether there's no such thing as COVID, pun kena lockdown. And they were asked, given to do, uh, I mean, in terms of education, kena cari pokok to go and find the internet. Whereas some of them are, you know, sekolah kurang murid. They can continue with their education system. But it's one size fits all. So I think uh, I look forward to a new approach whereby the government should go more for boutique style lah. Bukanlah boutique mesti macam uh, uh, apa, a hotel. But you know, uh, it must meet the needs of the uh, different people. This is where data is very important. Big data, you know, internet of things. We need to know where are the poor, where are the vulnerable people, who are the ones who are really no, uh, in need. Not having just a blanket statement for all. Okay, that's basically Okay. May, may I chime in there because uh, you know the, these are things that I resonate very well with. Again, learning from the HIV epidemic, there is a, a mantra in the HIV world: know your epidemic and know your response. Meaning, oh. you know, um, we have to be very, we have to be uh, to be looking at our data. Where are the infections and, okay. and target those infections? Uh, target those areas not just in terms of localities and geographic, but also uh, where are the clusters coming from? We need to do much, much better at, uh, at being targeted, at being boutique, rather than this blanket response. Yeah, I completely agree. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Nedrid. And so I think some uh, I've been adding additional points by Prof. Adiba. I think I think uh, as the Dr. Medi mentioned, I think uh, uh, we in Malaysia, I think it has been something that we experienced. I think everything goes back to government. So because of that, when it comes to any matters arising, including what we are experiencing of this COVID nineteen and the impact of it to the economy, I think I mean largely the population goes back to the government. Of course, there are other options, but I think it's too little for that matter. I think if we go for for Muslim, for example, I think we have this zakat. I think quite a number of uh, portions of this zakat has been spending for this. I think it's it's not much, but at least something. And I think it is a very important point that you have raised that I think we need to prepare our population uh, to face this when it comes to this, what we call it this, uh, difficulties of time, like now what we're experiencing, that we can cope for that. I think that would be a good, important 
points on that. Okay, well, we have the, uh, not the last question, but we have with Prof. Aziz, Azizuddin on this. Eh? In your opinion, how do you weigh the pros and cons of having a state of emergency in the current climate of Malaysian politics? Prof. Azizuddin, please. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, for me, uh, like I mentioned to you, even though I'm skeptical in the beginning, you know, but I kind of uh, accept, can accept you know, uh, that we should have uh, the emergency yeah, in order to give a full focus yeah, uh, to deal with the issue of uh, COVID-19 yeah, because I don't think we can afford uh, any more uh, MCO yeah, because I think you know, uh, government already uh, declared that by 22nd, yeah, almost all state will be under MCO except for Sarawak yeah, by 22nd yeah, of January. Yeah. So I cannot imagine, yeah, it's difficult actually uh, uh, for the government to declare that and also at the same time difficult for the people to deal with their MCO you know, when you cannot travel uh, up, over uh, over district, for example, you know, and also not only cross the border to other states, uh, something like that, eh? and also difficult also for you to uh, have a lunch and dinner at the restaurant and everything, and also the business also will be affected greatly. I think probably Madeline will explain uh, much better than me regarding this, you know. So I think uh, uh, with regard to all these issues, eh, well, do, all these concern that we face right now regarding COVID-19, definitely emergency is the way. Yeah? But of course, at the same time, uh, yeah, at the same time, you know, uh, we also need to empower, for example, uh, the, the independence uh, commissions eh, that I think going to, to be set up. Eh? And I think I hope the opposition also will join the, the the commissions, you know, because the commission, I think, will look in details uh, what's going, what's uh, the emergencies, uh, whether it can be prolonged or can be shortened, you know, and, and I think if we deal it successfully within these two weeks, then I think it can be shortened, you know, uh, because there's an impact eh? uh, by declaring depend, uh, uh, emergency, they must they definitely give a significant impact to our politics and also to our uh, you know our economy uh, globally, eh? meaning that the investor, for example, at the, at the beginning, I think you see that, that there's a, a perception eh? saying that why we need to declare an, uh, an uh, emergency eh? rather than uh, you know why not we continue like MCO like before you know uh, because it's but with the the current uh, you know uh, data that we got you know the increased number of infection, I think that's the best way eh, to have emergency. But at the same time, so we need to empower, like I mentioned to you, uh, the commission to check and balance and so to decide what's best uh, for, for, uh, for, for the government, whether to prolong, also to shorten uh, the, uh, the emergency. Eh. But I think at the same time, when it comes to politics, eh, uh, the level of politics now, I think, be reduced eh, compared to before. That's clearly, we can see what's going on right now. Eh. So, uh, in fact, even though there's uh, some views saying that, uh, you know, criticizing the government, uh, and sometimes as well, uh, this is the opposition because of too much politicking and everything, but at least I think focus already there, you know? And people, uh, talking about people, I think people already going through the MCO, the first MCO and also the other, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, since last year, you know, uh, which I think people know already how to deal uh, with, uh, with uh, COVID-19. Eh? The only thing is, you know, uh, probably they also need more information eh, from the government, from the health ministry in order uh, to deal with the issues. Eh? Uh, and also, with regard to vaccine, for example, I think raised by Medellin also, Pradiba, uh, because we have, for example, like me, probably I know, uh, I listen to world news eh, regarding vaccine. Eh? But from for the point of view of people on the ground, probably they know nothing about vaccine. Yeah? So, and they keep asking when they can receive it. Uh, and also when, uh, you know, a government can bring, uh, you know, you know, because we have to import it, yeah? vaccine from abroad and yeah? come to the countries. Yeah? And whether uh, this is responsible of the federal government or responsible of the state government. Yeah? Because as, as we know that uh, Slango state government decided to, to buy, you know, uh, to purchase a uh, vaccine for their own populations, you know, uh, is that also 
uh, you know, uh, other state like state of Kedah, my state here yeah, in UM, yeah, uh, also have to do something similar to this. Yeah. So meaning that there's so many still uncertainty in terms of policy and uh, clarity. Yeah, uh, what next to do and so what the best to deal with the issue. And for me, uh, MCO is so tough yeah, uh, uh, to the local population. Yeah. Uh, that's why I think we can afford to have MCO anymore, but uh, we try to find the best way, eh, best option uh, in order to reduce the number of uh, infections eh, among the population. Because we actually, you know, uh, this uh, I think like Prof. Adiba saying that this is very clever, uh, you know, uh, virus, you know, and uh, even though we have information about this, but still also we have difficulties eh, without the help of the government. Yeah? So in that way, I think hopefully yeah, uh, by having uh, emergency darurat, yeah? so meaning that we can really give, uh, really focus to help the population, help the people, and at the same time, so people can gain uh, more you know, understanding and knowledge about the virus and so vaccine everything. And together, uh, we can reduce the number and hopefully to eradicate fully yeah, uh, COVID-19 uh, in Malaysia. Yeah? At the same time, so uh, dealing with the issue of economy, lah, another issue which I think so concerning and so uh, affected uh, people greatly in, in the country. So I think that's all for me. Uh, I pass back to you, for example. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Azuddin. I think you have been, you know, been re uh, repeating uh, your points that we need this uh, emergency for the survival of this, what we call it, to, to, to put down this a wave of this politics in, in Malaysia, in particular during this COVID-19 pandemic. I think uh, for those viewers who are watching us, you may uh, post your questions in the, if you are watching through FB Live, you can post it in the comments. Or those who are on the Zoom, you may ask questions directly, uh, perhaps. So we are now open to Q&A. And uh, I have a few questions here. Uh, one is from a Brother Sayuti. Eh? Uh, perhaps this question addressed to, I think we, we can open to everyone, but I suppose uh, the point would be for Prof Nick as well as Prof Azizuddin. Eh? As among the main reason behind the proclamation of the emergency governance is to prevent the general election and mix the pandemic. Do we have any other alternative to delay general election without resorting to emergency ordinance or is it the, the one and and the only choice that we have, perhaps uh, Prof. Ni and also Prof. Aizuddin can respond, uh, or maybe yeah, okay. other panelists as well. Okay. Uh, yes, there Prof. is Nick. also a question in the in the Zoom uh, Q and A. There question, yeah. I think, about uh, uh, what does, for example, grave emergency should cover. Uh, I think Article One Five Zero made it very clear that grave emergency. Uh, if the Agong is satisfied, if the Yantuan Agong is satisfied that grave emergency exists, where the economic life, the safety, and also public order are affected, then, uh, then uh, I mean, emergency may be declared. Now, the mm. issue of pandemic is: does it falls under any of these categories or not? I mean, that, that's a question. That that's a question. Uh, if you if you are a law student, then probably you're probably looking at Stephen Kalong Ninkan decided mm. by the Privy mm. Council where the private council had, had, had defined, in fact, and expand the meaning of uh, emergency to include also pandemic or endemic, you know? And um, in that respect, uh, it's already answered the question of people who raised this question whether COVID-19 falls under the category of safety or economic law or public order, okay? So, so that, that would definitely be uh, something very clear and very objective, and in fact, when we talk about insatisfied, uh, if the young Diptuanagong is satisfied, then it is the young Diptuanagong who actually decides whether emergency should, should be declared or not. And the government is there to propose and suggest, but it is the final say of the young, okay, young okay. Diptuanagong. So, uh, of course, uh, there were this argument that there were cases in the past uh, decided by the federal court, the Supreme Court, also the private council that uh, the young Diptuanagong acted uh, on the advice of the cabinet and the prime minister. But of course, you see, uh, uh, the interpretation of that can change. 
Okay, but going to the question just now that uh, Dr. Azam was was asking whether is there any other way of dealing with uh, you know with with uh, parliamentary sitting or parliamentary elections uh, other than uh, declaring an emergency? And now you see the provision of of Article fifty four and fifty five are quite strict. I mean, if there is uh, a vacancy in any seat, it has to be filled up within 60 days after it's been notified by the speaker of the day one or the speaker of the day one Ilangan Negeri. Okay, so that's very strict provision. So there's no other way uh, that you can stop the organization of or organizing an election uh, if there is a vacancy. Similarly, if the life of parliament has, has uh, reached the, 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 the five year period, then it has to be election. Uh, it has to be a dissolution of parliament, either automatically or by the declaration by the Yang Di Pran Agong, uh, then election has to be held within 60 days. So in that respect, Sarawak election would have to be held in June because that is the period where the life of uh, Sarawak Dewan Unangan Negeri will end. So therefore, it has to be held. Uh, but so if emergency is declared, then emergency ordinance can be passed to delay. Uh, or postpone. That's what happened in Batu Sapi, in, in, in Greek and, and other places. Okay? Uh, so that's the reason why government will have to, you know, the government will have to recommend uh, to the Yang Tun Agong to declare a state of emergency. Thank you. I just want to add some, uh, some point. Eh? Razam. Okay, I just want to add, uh, hopefully you can listen to me. Uh, regarding whether, of course, I think uh, the only way to, to stop uh, or to delay uh, the election is, uh, is only by declaring uh, uh, of emergency. But uh, I think if we want to continue to have elections, yes, I think we, for those uh, who promote democracy, everything, probably we want to see election to be held, even though during the pandemic period. But the problem is that there's a big risk yeah, uh, to have election during this pandemic. Yeah? Because uh, like I mentioned to you, I mean, like I mentioned earlier, uh, Romania, for example, uh, decided to postpone their elections. You know? uh, so, and also we can we already see what happened uh, in Sabah, uh, which I think the spread of uh, COVID-19 happened in Sarawak and also because of people who travel there and so came back uh, to peninsula, then they spread uh, the virus in the peninsula uh, as well because of the election. You know? And another example is in in United States, for example, yeah? uh, during the presidential election, even though there's a suggestion uh, earlier yeah. eh, to delay as well the presidential election, but because uh, there's many resistance eh, uh, among uh, member of Congress eh, that continue, uh, they, 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 are, they need uh, the election to be continued. Eh? In order to decide uh, who's become the next uh, president, eh? because the terms is there, eh? uh, the, the terms are already fixed. Then they have to to uh, to have eh? uh, the election. Eh? So that's that's why we get already see that what happened last uh, November, uh, Joe Biden won uh, the election. Eh? But uh, back to the issue of parliamentary election, for example, eh? we still have mandate mandate eh? uh, until two thousand twenty three. Eh? So I think. Uh, uh, why we need to see the uh, you know uh, the elections earlier eh? because the mandate is still there you know? uh, because the mandate is determined by the people uh, because people that voted for member of parliament actually people not really voted for the government but the people voted for the member of parliament people of parliament that decided what government to be formed you know? so that is the reality of Malaysian politics right now you know? so because the mandate is there so I don't think with the current situation is conducive enough to have election earlier. Unless if there is an, uh, I mean, the term is end already, like in the case of Sarawak, yes, the term will end in June. Eh? So because of that, I think the only option that we have is to to uh, declare, the, to have a proclamation of uh, emergency. Eh? So I think that's some addition lah, that I want to add uh, regarding this. Eh? If I may, if I may jump in again, I know I'm splitting hairs here a bit, but from a public health point of view, uh, it's I think the election itself, in terms of voting, um, uh, measures can be taken to make it safe. You know, like uh, extend the days for for voting, the uh, postal votes, and so forth. 
what where the um, the concern is in the uh, campaigning, you know, and the Malaysian style of campaigning of charamas and mass gatherings. So, so that is going to be very difficult to, to control in Malaysia, I think. So the the voting itself, I think um, we, we, we could look at different ways of doing it, but um, trying to tell um, people in, in Kelantan not to go for house-to-house -house, uh, campaigning is going to be near impossible and, and uh, stopping the mass gathering, which is where, uh, what is what COVID likes. Okay, thank you, Prof. But I think there's a point that I want to raise to Paul Azizudin. You mentioned that if you were to refer to the mandate uh, by the people, and that's all from the uh, constitutional point of view, I think, uh, the next general election, or we call it PRU 15, will only take place uh, sometimes in 2023. But what is now, uh, we are talking about politics, huh? uh, what is now taking place just before, I think just a couple of days before this uh, emergency or so emergency was declared, that there were, um, that's not rumors, but there were talking or there are, I mean, incidents by these politicians, by the, some MPs that they withdraw uh, their support to the present government. So do you think that uh, we, we need to wait until 2023 or just after this, uh, I mean, this emergency ends, uh, this MCO ends or within this MCO, and then we can have the election? What do you think of that? Okay. Uh, I think uh, there's a uh, many uh, ways uh, to to see on this uh, this issue. I know that uh, there's a you know a proposal coming from Amno, for example, submitted you know, uh, to support uh, Anu Abraham as a prime minister and uh, submitted already to 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 Agong eh, regarding uh, regarding this. Eh? But I think there's a before that you know you can see that there are many uh, you know many voting. Eh? Uh, in the in the parliament where you can see that the government always uh, defeated eh, the opposition eh, in many uh, many votes. Eh? So I think if they want to defeat the current government, I think that the best way is in the parliament. Eh? So I know there's still the big issue whether uh, uh, whether the word of no confidence or word of confidence can be tabled in parliament. I think that's within the parliament uh, 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 jurisdiction eh, that can explain on that issue. So. But I think uh, because of previous case, you can see that uh, uh, Gamma always won uh, uh, the, the, the voting. And uh, even though there's an attempt, uh, later on, several member of parliament to declare not support, uh, supporting the, the current prime minister. Uh, but I think, uh, I'm not sure whether that's because of the reason why we declare uh, emergency, you know. Uh, but I think uh, we got, if we look on this issue separately, yeah, uh, actually the bigger issue that the government have to deal, even if there's a new government later on, uh, you know, established, they also have to deal with COVID-19, which is the number increasing. Yeah? So, which I think the, for the people you know, on the ground, because uh, I'm also people, I'm also looking at people on the ground, they already uh, fed up yeah, with the uh, politicking yeah, among politicians. Yeah? In fact, they ask actually yeah, politician to be uh, take care of their people on their constituencies yeah, rather than keep politicking, uh, determining who's be in government or not, everything. Yeah. So, because people are already concerned about their economy first, actually. Yeah. Health, of course, but economy first because so many people, young people, they, remember, they, they lost jobs, everything. You know. So, they want a stable government that can, uh, can, uh, you know, uh, can, can help them. Yeah. Uh, by reducing the number of uh, politicking, reducing the politicking uh, among politicians, I think it can help give a focus to government to deal with the issue of health and also uh, uh, economy. Okay, another point that I, can, I want to raise as well, you know, uh, whether election is the best option, there's a debate as well among people, uh, whether the best option that can ensure the stability in the government, uh, meaning that is to establish a stable government in Malaysia. Uh, that also can raise a lot of questions eh? because you can see now uh, the current, you know, we used to have Brazil National as a coalition government, but crumble. Eh? Now, Brazil National is not, uh, you know, only uh, three party left eh? in the in the Brazil National. 
and also at the same time in Pakatan Harapan they also have leadership problem and also uh, difficulties in the in the parties no? then we have Perikatan Nasional forming just uh, as a marriage of communion in order to establish a government to replace Pakatan Harapan government eh? which are rejected by them also by the people eh? so in, in that case you can see that you know there's no real stability in the coalition government or coalition parties eh, in Malaysia, which I don't think by having election also can bring stability in the government. Eh. So while we are facing with the bigger issue now, COVID-19 and also economy, why not we focus on this issue, deal with issue, then later on we decide. Eh. That's why I think by proclamation of uh, emergency until 1st of uh, August, if uh, we are able to deal with the issue of COVID-19 economy, then I think we can go uh, with the earlier election after the end of emergency. I think that's probably the good way of thinking that, okay, now we are focused on two big issues, then later on we deal with the issue of voting. So I think that's probably the reason behind the proclamation of uh, emergency. Okay, thank you much, Prof. Azizuddin. Okay, we have a question from Prof. Adiba. Beyond policy, beyond ordinance, beyond politics, what are the specific that can be recommended to the government from medical perspective? Is there a channel to contribute such expert opinion? Do you think a COVID-19 expert panel need to be established as a form of royal commission to ultimately handle this pandemic? Yes, yes, I think uh, the short answer is yes. And, and I think I alluded to earlier that what we need is a really, um, you know, a, a, a working together. This is, this is a, a complex um, uh, problem. And that's beyond, uh, as I kept uh, stressing, this is beyond health. Um, although, you know, obviously health plays a central part. And um, I was one of the signatories to, to that open letter to the Prime Minister and one of the points that we made was um, the formation of a multi, you know, multi-sectoral task force to deal with it. Take, um, for instance, uh, the issue of schools, you know, um, the when to open, when to close, when to uh, uh, close schools need a specific working group just to debate these issues on schools and, and universities um, that must bring together people from health, teachers, parents, in, you know, and, and get uh, people's viewpoints so that we, we come up. Of course, the public health people will need to set the matrix and the criteria for, for opening schools. But um, there are still many things that can be done. Um, uh, because I think uh, it's super important to let our children continue um, to, to go to school. It's beyond just the, the classes, but it's that social interaction that uh, uh, that's very important for, for school children. I think there, there we, we don't have time, but there are many things that can be done for instance that um, takes advantage of our climate. We've, we've not talked about the importance of climate of the importance of ventilation that can that uh, hasn't been spoken about enough in terms of um, you know sort of the mid to long term uh, ways in which we can learn to live with the virus so the schools for instance you know open the doors open the windows have fans you know um, have classes outside it, 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 but but these things require uh, people who are actually dealing with it to to see um what the problems are what the solutions are so again it you know it cannot just be a pure top-down um decree to to deal with this so that's why specific working groups whether it's for um you know factories whether it's for construction uh industries uh, schools universities uh etc cetera, etc cetera, need to be formed and i believe this is in the process of being formed Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Adiba. This question, uh, the question that I just asked you is from Joseph Lee, and he also asked a question to Dr. Medlin. Eh? Uh, number of cases in, is inversely correlated with GDP. That is true at any part of the world. 
Now, besides stimulus grant that is bound to go to the drain, what are the best approach to increase our GDP, such as new way of doing business, product innovation, shift towards human capital development? A big question mark for that. Dr. Medri? Unmute, please. Okay, okay yeah. Uh, what was the last part of the question? I can't really hear. Is it about human capital development? Yes, yes. Yes. Yes, yeah, super capital development. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Very, yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, if you notice that uh, a, a big chunk of our stimulus packages is about how to, number one, there are three objectives, main objectives. Yeah? Number one is, of course, to address uh, survival of our uh, our people, you know, in terms of uh, livelihood, you know, to ensure that livelihood uh, 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 put on the table. So that was the main intention, the first one. The second one is basically for businesses, you know, to ensure businesses, the survival of the businesses. And the third one is basically for economy in the long term. Now, if we look at all these packages, uh, the economic or stimulus packages, it is basically to address the economic side of it. And, and economics has always been associated with one, is that gross domestic product, like it was mentioned now, it was inversely uh, correlated. Now, another element uh, that was, uh, I think towards the end, Prof. Adibar did mention about education just now. Uh, I am really concerned because I come from a state. I come from Sarawak. I have known of my relatives. I've known of my, you know, people from my longhouses who, whose children are very much affected by the COVID, not in, only in terms of health, but also in terms of their human capital uh, development. Yeah. Okay. This is where what we have been talking about is what we call the lost learning generation. It is one whole year. In the year 2020, Imagine the whole year of 2020. You know, I was envisioning when Tun Mahade first announced, you know, Vision 2020. I was imagining that we are going to fly, you know, what Malaysia was going to be like because I was just a, a student then. I was in the university when we were asked to imagine uh, what is Vision 2020. I can, I could, at that time, I cannot imagine that this is what is happening to us, that we are almost like one step forward two step back backwards you know the things that we have uh, achieved so far suddenly because of the covid and because of things that are happening in our country i'm also talking about governance you know we, we must not forget the issue of covid is one level there is issue of integrity governance corruption which has been plaguing our nation so it kind of you know all interrelated now coming back to what you call this now uh, when you talk about human capital development when we talk about human capital, there are uh, two big elements involved here. Number one is education. Number two is skill. And of course, number three, there is now to the third level, is what we call health. So these three uh, interrelated factors, um, COVID-19 has really, really affected these three elements of human capital development. Number one, education, as I said, the lost learning generation. I really hope that we are not just uh, thinking about where they went to open the school, when to close the school, you know, how many, uh, uh, how many hours, uh, uh, you know, like we, uh, the, the recent announcement, whether the, uh, the, our children should start going to school on the 20, what, 21st, 20, whatever it is, or it should go after that. You know, these kind of policy decisions that are not consistent, parents were angry, and then we heard uh, today NUTP was saying people accusing teachers of makan gaji buta, you know, we should go beyond all this, you know. I think our nation, we need to work together and how we can address the problem faced by our children. The lost learning generation. Government need to invest a lot in that. Not just, you know, uh, repairing sekolah-sekolah uh, daif. Don't talk about sekolah daif in Sarawak. It is really a big issue. Issue. Now we need about infrastructure. We need uh, about face-to-face -face learning. Now, if and people were talking about, you know, uh, uh, technology. People in Sarawak they don't really. Uh, we, we are too obsessed with, you know, high-end technology. We forgot that they are technologies that the people, you know, simple things as simple as TVs, simple things like radio, television, Malaysia. We can still use those facilities, and it works in the rural areas. So why are we worried about them not assessing 4Gs or 5Gs or whatever and asking them to go and climb trees in order for them to sit for exam? Of course, you don't ask them to climb trees, but in order for them to have access. 
whereas you can still use cyclo styling machine. And I do respect a lot of the teachers in the rural areas are doing their best, you know, to uh, to meet all these things. That's why we cannot have a one size fits all. Now, an, another element of the human uh, human capital development, besides education, is skill development. We talk about TVET. What is happening to our TVET? What is happening to skill development in our country? It has long been neglected. We are too focused on the academic that we forget that there is the other side to it. Now then we realize that our communities, our, our students, our universities, we, could, we should not just focus purely on academic achievement, you know, how many A's that they are going to achieve, but also in terms of skill development. And the third element is, of course, health. So that these three things, I think, for the next level of government uh, policies, uh, although these have been discussed uh, in, in the budget, but I think for the next, or rather for the future, in terms of um, uh, if there is a need for the government to introduce another package, eh, package, uh, bantuan or whatever, I think these are the new elements that I would like to be seen or to be included uh, in the government's new packages. Not just... Uh, fiscal or not just uh, monetary policies or fiscal policies alone, but incentive to for uh, uh, human capital uh, development and empowering our community. Uh, to me, empowering is very, very important because uh, we have so long forgotten about the role of the community in, you know, in, in addressing problems on their own. Because we are too much, as I mentioned, now I'm reiterating that we are too dependent on the government. I think one of the countries that where the population, almost everything we depend on the government, you ha the government will tell you have to do everything. And, but then after that, we blame the government if, uh, if we were given the wrong prescription. So why don't we take, we play a more important role. Eh? So I think the universities have an important role to play, NGOs, the communities, uh, the public sector, of course, and then the private sector. These four helix, very important collaboration between the four. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Madrina. I think perhaps uh, with the remaining time, we can only take one question, and this the last uh, question. Uh, perhaps this question is addressed to both Prof. Nick and also Prof. Azizuddin. Uh, we have a number of emergency declarations based on need analysis appropriate to the time and season. Would you agree that this declaration is akin hitting two birds with one stone? maintain political stability and to have a united focus on handling COVID-19. That and a stable government make it hard to fight this virus. Perhaps uh, you, Prof. Nick can start first and then followed by Prof. Azizuddin. Well, to me, I, I see it uh, as a, a very unfortunate uh, situation that I think the present government is facing. Uh, the time when uh, the pandemic was, was raging, uh, and at, at the same time, there was also some problems with, with majority uh, support for the government of the day. So uh, in that respect, whatever uh, that the government of the day is doing would be, you know, uh, would be uh, translated or would be interpreted in, in, in not just single uh, definition is defined in two ways that like what you have mentioned just now and the, the, the question that you have raised is, I think this is very unfortunate, but I believe that, I mean, uh, for whatever uh, whatever worth that the government is doing, I think uh, the government has come to a, 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 a situation where they have to make a decision. And this decision is to, to request for the request the Yang Diputan Agung to declare a state of emergency. And whatever perception that come after that will have to be dealt with uh, in a way that would help the government to be sort of making uh, a good decision at the end of the day, I think. So in that respect, whatever you look at it, whatever way that you look at it, uh, what, what we are facing now is a, a real thing. I think that Dr. Adiba has, has really explained clearly. Uh, and uh, so that would then give the government uh, what we call that as a, 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 a decision to be made. So that decision has to be made and it, has, it was made that this pandemic will have to be dealt with uh, by an emergency law. And uh, you know, so whatever the perception that comes after that uh, will have to be dealt with uh, by the government. And uh, 
they will have to do it in a way that will not affect their focus on dealing with the economic problem as well as dealing with the pandemic problem. That's my view. Okay, thank you, Prof. Nick. Prof. Zidin, please. Yeah, I agree with uh, Prof. Nick, uh, which is, I think, yes, now is a very opportunate time for us, you know, uh, not only us. Eh? I think it's an issue is very global issues. And uh, government uh, need to be, meaning that we need to have a stable government, you know? which I think we don't have since uh, last year when we have a change of government. You know? So that's why in, in the context of this, uh, uh, decision already made, yeah? meaning that we, uh, pro proclamation, uh, pro proclamation of the uh, emergency is needed yeah? in order to give a focus, yeah? uh, give a full focus of all effort, all policy, and also all resources that we have to deal with the issue. Yeah? So I think, uh, you know, one good thing that I can see uh, from uh, the emergency is that there's a time frame. That's I think is a good thing. You know? uh, unlike before, which uh, when uh, we I think we abolish uh, the emergency uh, ordinance eh? somewhere I think in 2011, if I'm not mistaken, you know? uh, which is I think it started already uh, the emergency uh, when uh, we declare emergency in 1969. Eh? So uh, that's why I think the Law such as the Dinner Secret Act uh, was there before, eh? Not, uh, later on being uh, abolished eh? uh, by uh, Najib Turazak when he was a prime minister. Eh? But this time, I think is more clearer. Eh? Uh, focus on the health and more clearer in terms of timeline and the power given to the government and also and the function eh? of the government also mentioned there. Even though there's a limitation in the role of the parliament, but I think uh, all everything is put. Uh, you know, together in order to deal with the issue of COVID-19 and also the economy as well. Eh? So in, in that sense, I think, uh, let's see what's happened. And I think we as a people also have a, our, our role eh? to be critical of the government as well. If government, I don't know, where, where we can see government probably go beyond the power given to them in under the uh, Ministry of Union. So I think people have uh, their duty as well to check and balance the government and of course uh, opposition also have their, uh, their role. Eh? to make everything in order together with the government to deal with the issue of COVID-19 and also economic. So I think that's all from, from me. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, Prof. I think we are approaching uh, the end of our program today. But before we end, perhaps I would like to give the opportunity of, of every panelist to have a last few words. Uh, we can start with Prof. Adiba, please. Okay, so um, this current MCO um, and, and by extension, I guess the emergency is, as we all have heard, it's costing us uh, a great deal um, economically and psychosocially. So, uh, you know, I think it's up to all of us to ensure that we make full use of this and firstly, you know, I guess, try and bring the, uh, the numbers down as quickly as possible. And, and as uh, Madeline keeps saying, it's not just up to the government, it's also up to all of us. I think we know what we have to do, but also beyond those who, who um, are not in a position to uh, social distance and all that, um, there are other structural um, uh, things that need to be done. I've, I've spoken about them in, uh, for instance, the, the migrant workers, the, the prisons and all that. So it's going to take uh, a huge effort from, from everyone. But most importantly, I think the government needs to come up with a clear national plan um, that involves the, you know, the, 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 the federal government, but also decentralizing to to the state as well as the district level to empower um, uh, down to the, to, to the district level and below um, and uh, you know have a real real I mean the the um, multi-sexual involvement and uh, um, you know all of society response cannot just remain a slogan it really has to be operationalized Okay, thank you, Pradima. Uh, Dr. Dr. Medin, please. Okay, um, uh, thank you very much, uh, IASF, for organizing this uh, very important uh, webinar. Uh, I only like to point out two points. Eh? Uh, number one, 
I strongly believe that uh, we Malaysians must work together uh, because we have to live with this. Uh, uh, because many of us think that once the vaccine, once the vaccine is there, uh, then there will be no more COVID. I think uh, after reading through all the international journals and research on this COVID thing, I think we have to admit, or rather, I have to admit to the fact that we have to live with this COVID for at least for some time. Eh, Dr. Adiba, I don't think that it will go from our life at least in the next one year. So we have to live with it economically, from politics, from everything. So as Malaysians, we need to work together. We uh, because I don't I don't have any more I don't have any other place to go. I only have Malaysia and Sarawak for that matter. So this is the place that I'm born. This is the place that I'm going to live, and this is the place where I'm going to die. So I want it to be the place where uh, each and every one of us will do our best to make Malaysia a better place to live in with or without COVID. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Medlin. How are you today? Uh, yeah, I think it's a very good webinar where we can share our thoughts uh, regarding the issues. And I think uh, the best way for us is to come together uh, as United Malaysian dealing with the issue. And, and for politicians, eh, uh, uh, I think it's also good uh, to uh, to reduce a little bit, yeah, politicking the, the current situation, yeah? because I think why not we pull our effort focusing on one issue, health issue, and also economic issue, another one, yeah? which is very important. Then I think uh, politics can be, uh, you know, can be reduced yeah? uh, a little bit during this period until we uh, find way to deal with the issue and we can go back uh, uh, after the emergency, you know. Uh, in looking of the what next in our future when it comes to politics. But right now, I think give focus and also our attention to deal with the more concerning issue like COVID-19. I think that is, that's the best way. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Zidane. And last but not least, Prof. Nick, please. So I believe that the emergency has its own advantages. And of course, we talk about disadvantages a lot. There's a lot of criticisms about emergencies. But I believe that uh, in the light of the situation today, pandemic uh, that we are facing with now, I think uh, law can be used either uh, as, a, as an instrument to punish, but at the same time also as an instrument that can also help to make things better. So in other words, law can be used constructively, uh, you know, with that power that the government has today, I believe that government should be working on trying to find ways to use law to help to reduce the incidence of uh, in, in pandemic. I think, uh, which I think we have discussed that about a possible change to the law to improve the situations uh, rather than just to punish people for not, uh, you know, observing the SOP and observing the MCO. That that's my view. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, all the panelists. I think we are. Very delighted to have all of you here, as well as viewers uh, from FB Live, as well as from Zoom. We would like to thank everyone for participating in this important forum. It is, has been a very fascinating discussion, and I think, as what we have been discussed, uh, I think by the panelists, I think now the emergency ordinance are in place. Uh, we have to leave it, live with it until the, I think the longest, perhaps first of August. Uh, the 2021 and I think on many occasions all the panelists have agreed that we cannot leave it only to the government to handle with this. All of us have to work together to give a help to solve this problem. It's not only in the hands of the government. With that, I would like to thank Prof. Nick Ahmad Kamal, uh, Dr. Dato. Dr. Madeline Burma, Prof. Adiba Kamruzaman and Prof. Azizuddin for spending your time tonight to discuss with this matter. And I think we hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, help us, protect us. Thank you very much, everyone. Good night. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bye-bye.